All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 23rd day of March in the year of our Lord, 2023. And we're going to continue with our series, Calvinism versus the Scriptures. Today we're going to look at, let's see, what are we looking at? 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And he himself, I'm reading from the New King James here, second in this display, and he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Whole world. Now, <clears throat> yesterday, I pulled up on a, uh, searched on YouTube for uh, someone's comments on this, a Calvinist apologist comments on this, and he apparently was doing exegesis on 1 John. And when he got to this verse, um, he pretty much disintegrated <laughs> He could not accept what it says. He read it, he quoted it, he looked at the meanings, and then he just started sputtering nonsense. It was rather amusing to see the gyrations he was going through because he could not deal with the clear meaning of this text. So what he did, he started blowing a smokescreen. Uh, talking about the context here and and how John wasn't talking about the propitiation uh, of Christ for the entire world in the previous verses or the verse, he, yeah. <laughs> so he's talking to he's addressing it to Christians, saying, and he himself is a propitiation. Christ himself is a propitiation for our sins. And then he adds, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. I happen to just look it up in Calvin's commentaries. He can't handle it either. <laughs> I says, oh, I get can't be true. That means Jesus atoned for Satan. Um, <clears throat> he just can't handle it. I mean, it, it, Cal, this this is this is uh, kryptonite. Uh, to Calvinism. This is a torpedo shot right into the keel for Calvinism. Uh, the ship Calvinism sinks if it accepts this verse at its face value. Now, this particular apologist, uh, like when he goes through John chapter 6, tells us that when you do an exegetical study of a text, you must remain in that text. You can't go and compare it to other scriptures. If you know who I'm talking about, you probably heard him say that many times because he'll do a debate with someone and they will want to go, say, to Romans chapter 10. And James White will, oh, I wasn't going to mention his name. And he will say, because <laughs> I don't want it to be focused on one person. There's, he's not the only one. Uh, this particular guy will say, you have to remain in the text in this particular section that I've chosen <laughs> for the debate. You're not allowed to go other places in Scripture. Well, is that normal? No. Uh, scripture, we compare Scripture with Scripture. If one passage is unclear, 
we go to other passages that speak about that same thing. It's just like, how do you be, how are you saved? Well, the, the section of scripture that is most clear on that is Romans chapter 10. It tells us exactly how a person is saved, as far as what a person must do. Believe in your heart that God has raised Christ from the dead, and you know that tells us who Christ is. As Paul says in another place in Acts, that that God has furnished proof to all men of who this man Christ is by raising him from the dead. And then Paul goes on to say, and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus as Lord. So one is the fact of Christ, his atoning death and resurrection. You don't have to know all the details. Just he's God's Messiah. He is the appointed one. He's the promised one that was promised all the way back in the Garden of Eden. And then join yourself to him. To, uh, you enter into a relationship with him as, as you, you, you join yourself to him as, as confessing him as Lord. You're not just making a, an empty statement about, yeah, he's Lord. Well, God is Lord, yeah. <laughs> That's not it. It is, he's your Lord. You, you recognize who he is and you join yourself in a relationship to him by confessing him with your mouth. Uh, normally, that's what happens in baptism, by the way. Believer's baptism. It doesn't happen in infant baptism. No, when you, when you are baptized as a Christian, a believer, you confess Christ. The water is irrelevant. The water is unnecessary. That goes back to Jewish traditions in the Old Testament. It's a hangover from that. It's a tradition. The water is a tradition. Because well, even John the Baptist, who was baptizing with a baptizing with a baptism unto repentance, said, "I baptize with water, but the one who is coming, he'll baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire." And that's a reference to the Old Testament law about cleansing water and fire. So there, there's the water really is just that is not what saves you. It is confessing the Lord Jesus. That's why Paul doesn't even mention baptism there. Paul did not put a huge emphasis on baptism. Not baptism in water. That doesn't do it. But it, it is a marker in our lives. It's, it's something for us to remember. Yes, I did this. I con com committed myself to Christ. But we, uh, and I was baptized, you know, so it's, it is, uh, serves a function for us. But it is not salvific, obviously. You may baptize for the wrong reason, and all you do is get wet. But it's the confession, as Paul said, if you believe in your heart that God has raised you from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, the Lord Jesus, it can be translated either way, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. All right, so we're going to look at this verse, 1 John 2, 2. He himself is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, or, uh, but also for the whole world. Now, this particular apologist that I accidentally named says you can't go compare it with other scriptures. Well, he holds to the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is the same as the Westminster Confession of Faith, essentially. So I'm going to go to the Westminster Confession of Faith because it's more broad. Uh, it, more broadly accepted, uh, including by Baptist. The only difference is the the London Baptists ripped off. They didn't have copyright laws. Ripped off the Westminster Confession of Faith because it was the official government confession, and just edited it slightly to make it compatible with their Baptist beliefs, their Baptist uh, church ideas, and Baptist baptism, basically few words here and there, but that's it. it. It wouldn't pass a copyright test today because it is too close to the other. There's also a uh, confession by the uh, Congregationalists that preceded this, that one, I believe, 
But I'm just going to use the, the Westminster Confession because that's broadly accepted uh, among Calvinists, period, as an authority, even if they might have different church government things. So what we're going to do is we're going to look here. Now, this has to do with James, uh, this, this apologist. I watched him for too many years. Every once in a while, I go back and see what he's doing. He's, he's going off the deep end. Uh, he's, he's going back to the law. He's becoming a Judaizer. Not the Hebrew roots movement, theonomy. This is chapter one of the Westminster Confession of Faith of the Holy Scriptures. And we looked the other day at chapter three of God's eternal decree, dealing with election. Yeah, and how does that, does, does the Bible use the word elect the way Calvinism uses the word elect? No, it doesn't. The God of Calvinism, Actually, real Calvinism, the God of the Westminster Confession, the Second London Baptist Confession, when you understand their description of God, it's not the God of the Bible. It's the God of Aristotle. And let me briefly go into that slightly. I'll go into that in more details in other videos. But you get into, into the strange world of Aristotelian metaphysics which has polluted the church since at least the 4th century. People, well, actually before then, but it became a big thing with Augustine. Augustine did tremendous damage to the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, but something worse happened about 100 years before Augustine, and that was Constantine. When... Christianity began to become the state religion, the imperial religion. And by Augustine's time, it was definitely the state religion, enforced by the power of the state. So if you varied from it and Augustine uh, agreed, you are to persecute the, the uh, dissidents unto death even. Uh, Augustine brought in all kinds of ideas that don't come from the scripture. Ideas about sex and marriage and everything. He brought his own garbage, his own baggage in. And philosophy. And philosophy. Uh, before he became a Christian, he was raised by a Christian mother, but before he became a Christian, he had dabbled in the various forms of paganism, uh, Manichaeism, and some of the others. You, you hear, hear about the Gnostics. But all this goes back to uh, Neoplatonism. Um, all this goes back really to some of the ideas of Aristotle uh, that became very popular. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, his life work was to fuse the philosophy of Aristotle with uh, Christianity. And that, Thomas Aquinas, is, is caused, has caused a huge explosion. Well, if you can call the anything huge among Reformed Baptists. Among the Reformed Baptists, uh, James White himself has been declared a heretic by the, by the disciples of Thomas Aquinas, the Baptist disciples. They're really disciples of a man named uh, James Dolzal, who is, for the last decade or more, has been a real advocate for these uh, pagan metaphysical ideas that have been accepted for almost, well, for at least a century and a half, or a millennium and a half, among Christians as orthodox, uh, the orthodox ideas of, of God and his nature. But they're not. They come from philosophy. And once you, once you go back and look at Aristotle and what he thought about his hypothetical God, now, make that real... Shorten it up real quick, because this explains why Calvinism is what Calvinism is. But it's not just Calvinism. This is Roman Catholicism. This is probably present in Orthodox, uh, Orthodox Christianity, in other words, Eastern Christianity, uh, <clears throat> which isn't really big on 
Augustine because Augustine spoke Latin, not Greek. He had Greek Christianity in the East and Latin Christianity in the West. Uh, but the East was the center of Christianity, contrary to what we think. Yeah, Rome was abandoned. They moved the capital to Constantinople. Um, now to modern day is Istanbul in Turkey. You know, at the isthmus of the Black Sea there. Because it was more central. Rome was too far in the hinterlands out west. <clears throat> but Aristotle, to oversimplify, but Aristotle, I think his his teacher was Plato. So, but they had these the Greek philosophers had these ideas of the ideal, uh, roughly the spiritual, which is perfect, and then the the physical, which is an imperfect based on the perfect, sort of. <laughs> Trying to oversimplify, but we don't need to get into the, into the weeds here. And when you, the Gnostics were highly uh, influenced by this, and the Gnostics held to ideas that could twist Christianity easily into their system, too. So, But they were, they come out of this stream. They're a little bit off to the side, but they, the roots are in Aristotle and Neoplatonism and you know going back even farther to Plato. So you had the the, the heaven the the high. So you, this was all ideas. So you had the like the the original the the perfect and then on earth you have imperfect representations of the perfect. Uh, the physical is always imperfect. It's the the spiritual is uh, roughly the perfect is up there someplace. They wouldn't use that language, but I'm trying to make it. Christians, this is foreign to us completely. Uh, and then, but Aristotle uh, philosophized about what the if there's a if there is a God, uh, then this God is is has to be perfect. The ideal God, what this God would be like. Uh, using human logic, of course. So, so he he uh, his idea of perfection would be uh, would have to be unchangeable. If God is perfect, and this is kind of logic that goes on here, uh, then he cannot change because change would be changing from perfect to something that is no longer perfect. He'd have to be either changing from less perfect to more perfect, which means he wasn't perfect or changing from perfect to something less than perfect because it's no longer the same perfect. You know, if you're absolutely perfect in all ways, any change would be impossible to remain perfect. So out of that idea springs everything else, the immutability of God, the impossibility of God. Well, I'll get into these in separate videos, but the changelessness of God, and God does say in the Bible, I change not. But then he says, therefore you are not consumed which to Israel. Which means his promises that he made to Abraham, God doesn't change them. He keeps his word. It doesn't mean he's absolutely unchangeable in all aspects. That's not what that scripture says. But, see, those ideas of absolute uh, immutability do not come from the Bible. They come from pagan philosophy. Uh, injected into the church through people like Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and others. Of course, Aquinas comes much later, but that's where the, you're, that's what we're talking about. Christian metaphysics are not Christian; they're pagan. Now, so you have the absolute enemy. Uh, again, this is human logic that derives this from a, a concept. It's it, Aristotle didn't work from God's revelation in creation. He worked out of his own head in his ideas of perfection and the ideal and then what the ideal God would have to be. So absolute immutability in all ways. In other words, his knowledge cannot change. It has to be perfect. And the only way, and 
Calvinism, if anything, is logical in a sense. So obviously, uh, and God can't be in time because time involves change and all, a whole lot, a lot of other things. Uh, God can't be in relation. God can't learn because that would involve changing in his knowledge. He would have to be adding knowledge. So he has to know all things perfectly, uh, which is where you get the eternal decree from. The only way God could have been perfect is that, and perfectly know all things if he's the if he decreed all things. And then in Calvinism, which fits with this, oh, but there's a certain a lot of illogical things in Calvinism. It doesn't see the system doesn't work. Uh, God knows out of his decree. He doesn't observe. So God cannot see us. The God of Calvin cannot see you. Because that would involve taking in knowledge. But what does the scripture say? Does the scripture say that God learns from God observes people's actions and that is, you know, in fact in in uh, in Genesis, God made, the scripture makes it very clear that, that God brought the animals to Adam to see what Adam would call them. God did not know what Adam would call them until Adam named them. That's what the scripture says. You can either believe the scripture or not. If you want to believe in your Calvinist theology or your classical Christian theology, which comes from Aristotle, you're welcome to it. But I am scriptura nuda. So let's go over to the Westminster Confession. In other words, Scripture, if the Scripture teaches it, I'm not going to believe somebody else. I'm going to look to the Scriptures to see what God reveals. And I'm not going to twist the Scriptures to make it fit my ideas. No, I don't want my ideas. I want what God says. And that's something that is difficult to do, I'll tell you. The flesh doesn't like that. So we, we're, we have a war going on in ourselves between the spirit and the flesh. So let's go to the Westminster Confession over here. I want to show you, unlike this, uh, this apologist that I accidentally named, who will use this debating rubric like when he goes through John chapter 6, of saying, no, you can't, and so he'll debate somebody, and that person will want to go someplace like Romans chapter 10 or other places in the Scripture. And he'll say, you can't do that. We're debating this passage. You're not allowed to go outside the passage. Really? So what does is, what is the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith say about that? If you see, this is chapter 1. If you look at uh, paragraph 9 here. See that paragraph right there? The infallible rule of the interpretation of Scripture is Scripture itself. Nothing like using Calvinism against Calvinism. Or Calvinists. Using it against Calvinists. Yeah, this is a standard rule of interpretation. Every Christian that knows how to study the Bible at all does this. You compare Scripture with Scripture. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, in other words, there's one meaning, is what they're saying there, not many meanings, it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. In the you know even in the law of Moses, we have and this is mentioned in the New Testament too. Every fact must be confirmed by two or more witnesses. All right, so we do that in the Scripture too. So well, I got a question here. It, it, am I understanding this right, too? That's really the question. So you look at other places that are speaking, of, preferably speaking about that subject, just like in salvation, how is a person saved? Uh, you know, is manifest throughout the New Testament, we're saved by faith in Christ. But when the actual details there, where, where does the Scripture actually speak about that? Uh, 
when the scripture is actually referring to that very subject, Romans chapter 10 is the clearest place. But we have many other witnesses that say the same thing. It's just not ex as extensively as is written there about the actual process. It's, it's not election. It's not predestination. It is hearing the gospel, believing in Christ. You know, Paul goes through a whole list of things there that you can't believe in him you've not heard of. So having knowledge of Christ coming and dying and rising again as, as a Savior. So you, you believe the gospel, and you have to believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead. In other words, you truly believe that Jesus is who Jesus is, according to the scriptures. And then you confess him with your mouth. You identify yourself with him. So there's a, a public, before man, as Jesus said, he that, uh, that confesses me before man, he'll confess before the angels of his father. So we have multiple things that that verify what Paul is writing there, too. It's consistent. The Bible is consistent in what it teaches. Now, in the New Testament, we're under the New Covenant, Testament Covenant. So that's not the same as the Covenant of Moses. So you don't go back to Moses when you're talking about Jesus Christ and the New Covenant. There is places in the prophets that talk about the New Covenant. Those are applicable, but the law is not applicable as far as salvation. But the law, Moses said that one would come that would be like him, and everybody would have to listen to that one, and that is Jesus. He was, he was referring to there. So this, again, this passage, this rule of interpretation, a contrary to this, see, when this, when this particular debater that this is what he, he uses his trick. He says, oh, we have to stay. This is the, the, the rules of the debate is that we're debating this passage. You're not allowed to go to other passages uh, to, to uh, support your interpretation. But what does, this would be the same as the, uh, I don't want to, the, 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 the London Baptist will say the same thing. So I'm not going to change it, but I, I picked uh, Westminster because it's more broadly accepted. Reformed Baptists are such a small group. The, the infallible rule of the interpretation of Scripture is Scripture itself. Therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, there's not multiple meanings for it. You don't get to put whatever you want on it. That God is communicating something. Not a whole bunch of things. You're not allowed to make it mean something else. It must be searched and known by other places, other places in the scriptures that speak more clearly. When you can't understand something, look for other places in the scripture that are talking about that same matter. And generally, Christians, we look in the New Testament. We are not under the law. There are people like this particular apologist, debater, that wants to put us under the law. See, Calvinism doesn't understand the clear distinction between gospel and law. Luther did. That's why you don't find any Lutheran theonomists. That would be crazy. Because Luther made a clear distinction between law and gospel. Reformed theology does not. So, back to our text that we're supposed to be looking at. For he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, people will try to get around the whole world. Calvin, in his commentaries, wrote, this is the elect of the whole world, the Christians of the whole world, not the whole world. It doesn't include the reprobate. In other words, people that don't believe. Not really. Now, th it, this 
what did we look at the other day? We looked at John. Let me get my right thing up here. We looked at 1 Timothy 2 4. Now, these dovetail, these fit together like a puzzle, these two verses. God desires, 1 Timothy 2 4, all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. See that? Who desires God, all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Calvinism denies that. The, as we saw in the video on election, that Calvinism uh, in their eternal decree, which in the Westminster Confession of Faith, and in the London Baptist and others, that and in Catholicism, really, this is metaphysical stuff that goes way back, that God decreed, God decreed to create some men for the purpose of salvation, some human beings for the purpose, and angels for the purpose of salvation, and some for the purpose of damnation. And those are absolutely fixed, and it is the decree of God, the eternal decree, that determines everything in exhaustive detail. So if you wonder why children, little children get raped, because of the decree of God. And this particular apologist actually confesses that. said, yes, that gives it meaning. Yeah, it shows God to be a monster. No, it doesn't. The, the sin does not glorify God. Let's be clear. Sin is not the will of God, but Calvinism makes it the will of God. They dance around that, but they do. There's, it's, it's logically impossible to deny that. So here we have Paul. So we have two apostles, not just biblical writers, apostles, Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament and does the, the tells us the why of the gospel, the why of the cross. He writes the New Testament theology, basically. He says that God desires all men, and we looked at that in the video on 1 Timothy 2, 4. Some will say, well, all kinds of men. That is not true. We looked at the Greek and this particular individual and others, it's not limited to him, try to get around what it says, either because of their ignorance of Greek, because the word pos, all, can mean in specific context, all kinds, all types of men. But in the form it's written in 1 Timothy 2.4, it means all, every single human being. All That's what it means in the Greek. The actual language says that. Now, if you believe in historical critical, or historical grammatical understanding of the scripture. You look at what the words actually say and mean and the, and the historical context, if that's relevant, to determine its meaning. But you also interpret scripture with scripture. So here, 1 Timothy 2, 4, the desire of God that all men be saved requires a universal atonement. Calvinists say, no, God would not cause his son to die for unbelievers. For those that won't accept, of course, it's, everything's decreed. So within their, in their theological system, it makes sense. But it doesn't make sense in the scriptures. If God des actually desires, that, now they, they hem and haw about that too, actually desires that all men to be saved, then he had his son die for all men. 
past, present, and future. Abraham was glad to see the day of Christ. Why? Because he the atonement had not been completed. He, he was still in his sin. There was no atonement. He was reckoned righteous, but God was looking forward to the crucifixion. Jesus had to die for all sin, past, present, and future. The sin of the whole world, cosmos, creation. And in doing so, he takes it, people out from under the law of sin and death, under either, you know, the violation of the law, the penalty, penalty is death, regardless, <clears throat> purchases it with his own blood for himself. So everything, uh, salvation, judgment, is now truly on the basis of whether or not you believe in Christ. All are under sin. God shut all under sin that he might have mercy on all, the scripture says. Maybe let me look this up. Romans 11.32 For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. See, this only makes sense with the universal atonement also. So again, God desires all men to be saved he, put, he shut all under sin, not just Adam. You know, why do the, are the descendants of Adam, why are we all sinners? Why are we born sinners? Why, we're, why are we born as slaves of sin? Because God shut us all under sin. For what end? That he might have mercy on all. And he is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now we know manifestly from Scripture in the New Testament that salvation, that for this, the atonement of Christ to apply to you, for you actually to be in that atonement, you must be in him. You must trust in him. If you don't trust in him, what that is, you've rejected the salvation of God. You've rejected his atonement. God atoned for the sins of the whole world, but those who receive that are the only ones who are actually saved. Because you must be in Christ, in the Savior, in his death and resurrection which also explains some of the language of Paul that's sort of hard to understand. We were crucified with Christ. He talks about us being raised with Christ because we are in him. If you're not in him by faith, by trust, if you haven't identified yourself with him, then you are condemned as a sinner for not believing in the salvation of God that's in Christ and him alone. Judgment is based on whether or not you belong to Christ, whether you trust in him. Because he has atoned for the sins of the whole world. Everyone that doesn't do that is condemned because they are sinners and they have not believed in God's salvation. See how God is justified in judgment by this because he atoned for the sins of the whole world. And you didn't receive it. Or you did receive it. It's a free gift. It's not based on works. Lest any man should boast. And without that, 
See, how will, how will God judge the world if Calvinist theology is true? It's not, because it's contrary to the Scripture. But if it were, hypothetically, cannot the lost say, based on Calvinist theology, if, if it's the God of Calvinism is the real God, which is ridiculous, he looks a lot more like Satan than he does with God, the God of Calvinism, that the eternal decree determines all things. Therefore, the sinner can say before the judgment seat of God, I sinned because you decreed me for, for me to sin. I could have done nothing else. You decreed it, therefore I did it. See, with the Calvinist system, where all things, and it's not just Calvinism, Luther believed in this too. It's just some sort of shove it into the back of the file cabinet someplace. In this system, this metaphysical system that Calvinism puts on the front burner, If God determines all things in exhaustive detail, then God is the author of sin. He is the cause of all things. And that's what Aristotle would say, yes, of course. Of course, that God can't actually cause anything because that would constitute a change in him, a change in his relationship. That's why they talk about the eternal decree as eternal, an eternal act of God, not an ongoing thing, because that God cannot see you, he cannot hear you, he cannot care for you. We'll get into the impassibility of God in a video, too. That God cannot love you. He can't know you. The God of Calvinism is this God, a dead stone. He's an idol made by man's mind. He cannot exist. He is not the God of the Bible. Even if that God were to exist, you could not possibly know he exists, and he could not possibly know you exist. Because that God could do nothing but contemplate himself. He is not the God of the Bible. And the humanity that Calvinism speaks of is not the humanity God created either. We were created to be God's image. Yes, we are born fallen, falling short of the glory of God. That's his image. But Christ is the second Adam, who is the express image of God. He is God. And we must all be conformed to that image by the power of God when Christ returns. That is the destiny of those who trust in him. Soon he will return and we shall all be changed, all his people, into his very image. And we shall see him as he truly is because we shall be like him. That's what the scripture says. And we will continue with Christ, perfectly in harmony with the Father, ruling and reigning for a thousand years during the real millennium that has not come yet. And then Christ delivers all things up to the Father and you have the new creation. But he must put all things under his feet before then, including death. Uh, the, the millennium is a necessary thing, too. As uh, Irenaeus was emphatic about in the second century. He was also emphatic that uh, the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation in the 90s, not prior to the destruction of the temple. It's amazing how men's ideas control what they see in the scriptures and what they don't see in the scriptures.
And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The gospel, according to Jesus, is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the gospel. We're saved by faith in Christ because of God's work. God gave his son to die on that cross, to rise again from the dead. Gave his son as a Savior and Lord that we should not perish, but have everlasting life. God desires that all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But the, whether a person does or not depends on whether or not you trust in Christ. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ.